¿Qué está pasando, amigos? We're back. In this video, we're continuing our discussion about the motion of a single pendulum. In the last two videos, we investigated what that motion looks like. We also derived the differential equation to describe that motion in terms of an unknown function, theta of t. Now we're going to talk about a very popular technique, which is linearizing this second order, nonlinear, ordinary differential equation to make it look a lot more beautiful. We said that the pendulum motion is governed by this famous equation, the second derivative of unknown theta plus g divided by l times the sine of that unknown theta of t, whatever that function is, is equal to zero. This was an expression of Newton's second law looking at it from the right paradigm. If you want to see more about that, go back to the last video. When we had that double dot notation, we knew that that was the second derivative of that theta. And the goal of solving this ordinary differential equation is to find functions theta of t that satisfy this relationship between the second derivative and the ordinary function itself. This is where I'm going to bring in some poetry. This equation is beautiful like a rose. What I mean is it takes a ton of time to grow. When we look at it, it's really beautiful. But if we grab it too hard in the wrong place, it's going to draw blood. In fact, this is one of the spaces that we learned that all the work that we do in calculus is nice in theory, but in practice, it doesn't hold water. There is no elementary function solution to this equation. I can't write like, oh, theta is equal to 5 times sine of t plus 3 times the ln of t plus something else to solve this thing. No matter what combination of elementary functions I try for this equation, none of those will solve this. That's a really famous theme in differential equations. Getting the differential equation takes a ton of work and it's a feat of human ingenuity, but once we have it, we're often up a creek without a paddle. We can't do anything with them using traditional analytic techniques. This is where pure mathematicians break down in a puddle of tears and cry to themselves because they love exact answers to hard problems. But applied mathematicians might start smiling and licking our chops. One of the really interesting ideas in linear algebra is when in doubt, turn really, really hard nonlinear problems into much easier linear problems so that we can leverage the techniques of linear algebra. We actually already started that process in a previous video where we looked at the shadow projection where we kind of shot the bob down onto a ruler and then looked at the motion of the shadow along that ruler to say something interesting about the actual position of the bob in terms of time. Visually, what we mean is when we start with our simple pendulum, it has a bob, it has an equilibrium position, a pivot, we have the cord, we have this vertical line defined by equilibrium position and the angle between the yellow vertical line and the orange cord we call theta. This equation is written as turn of theta. We derived all of our information in that particular circumstance. But remember that we could kind of shoot a laser straight down from above and project the position of the bob onto a one-dimensional axis, which is kind of a natural way for humans to think about that. We're used to like straight up and down and left and right from the standpoint of mathematics. Once we did that, we said, hey, if we could predict the location of that shadow at any time t, locally, as long as we're in a particular set of thetas, that might actually be a good proxy measurement for the location of the bob at any time t. The problem with that approximation scheme is all of the work that we've done in this differential equation was governed by the actual location of the bob in three space, and we've changed our assumptions. Remember, this equation was Newton's second law in disguise. It was the net force acting on a point mass is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And we did some algebraic manipulations as well as a lot of geometric argumentation to get it into this very, very special form. Specifically, this term right here had to do with the only force that had an effect on the motion of our pendulum 
we looked at that as the tangential force, the component of the force of gravity in the tangential axis to the arc shaped path. That force vector had a magnitude, which was the magnitude of the gravity vector, m times g, times the sine of negative theta. We oriented that force vector to be in the opposite direction of our acceleration. So that's where that negative came out. In other words, this term came from looking at the single tangential force in the tangent line axis to the path of motion. This term had to do with the idea of mass times acceleration. The acceleration that we chose had to do with path length. So we were literally looking at the function which we called the arc length, which was the actual length of the segment of the circle defined between equilibrium position and the position of the bob at any time t. That arc like function had the definition of L, the radius of our circle times whatever theta we traveled. It could be positive or negative. When we took the second derivative of that arc length, we got that theta double dot. M showed up on both sides, we resolved that, we brought this over to the other side, and that led to our second order nonlinear differential equation. However, we're claiming that differential equation is impossible to solve in the way that we would expect in a calculus class. And what we want to say is, well, what if we were to, instead of thinking about measuring arc length, so instead of thinking about trying to figure out what the acceleration is of the length of this curve in R3, what if we were to project that down onto the horizontal axis and use the displacement between the shadow under the bob and the shadow under the equilibrium position as a proxy measurement for arc length? So this problem exists in three space, or particularly it exists in a plane, and it has to do with curved arcs between those two points. This problem is a one-dimensional problem having to do with displacement between the equilibrium shadow and the bob shadow, a much, much easier problem. When we're working with curves, those get nasty. When we're working with lines, those are a lot more beautiful. So the thinking goes like this. I should really let you sit in a room for a few years and feel the extent of the pain of trying to solve this, eventually we're going to get to a point where we break down emotionally, psychologically, and physically and realize there's no hope in the world. After we get over ourselves, we come back and say, well, there's a little bit of hope. What if instead of trying to solve the grand problem, we broke it into a simpler version, which is project everything down onto a single axis and think about the measurement of displacement between those projections as a proxy measure for arc length. And the question that we would have is, one, when is that projection legitimate? When does the approximation actually hold water? And two, if we do that, does that simplify this equation? In words, we might ask that question, when is the signed length between the shadow of the bob at any time t and the shadow of equilibrium position along the horizontal axis a good approximation for the signed arc length. And when I say signed, both of those measurements can be negative or positive depending on where the position of the bob is at any time t. But that question very much has to do with this term sine of theta of t. And we actually have information about what that term is using our knowledge of trigonometry. Remember that in our shadow projection world, what's happening on this horizontal axis actually could be visualized using this triangle. If we just cut that line up into this space, that's the exact process that would happen. And we see this triangle is a really, really famous triangle from our previous lives in mathematics. Specifically, we can talk about the sine of the angle theta of t as the length of this base of the triangle divided by the length of the hypotenuse. Remember the mnemonic so ka toa? S-O-H, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. In other words, the sine of theta is going to be the distance between that projection of the bob and the projection of the equilibrium, the length of that particular base of this right triangle, which is U of T, divided by the length of the hypotenuse. But the length of the hypotenuse was L, the length of the chord of the pendulum. But this trigonometric relationship immediately suggests that I can replace the nonlinear term sine of theta of t with a linear term 
u of t divided by l. That's the equivalent of sine of theta of t. This linearization, this projection down into the horizontal axis solves one of our problems, which is it gets rid of the sine term. But the issue is it's not immediately clear that with this trigonometric relation, we can say anything intelligent about the second derivative of theta and how that relates to the second derivative of u. We can't necessarily replace, just by this inspection, the theta double dot with u double dot. Remember, the goal is to replace the hard differential equation with respect to theta into a linearized version along the horizontal axis. We've gotten one term. We're looking for another term. How do we do this? This is where we might get a pipe and start thinking, hmm, what do I know about theta and sine of theta that might allow me to make a replacement in terms of u for the second order term? After thinking for maybe a month or two, eight hours a day, five days a week, AKA after taking an advanced calculus class, we might recall that the sine of theta has a different representation using Taylor series. In particular, we can expand this thing infinitely around a point A, where A is zero, McLaren series, as the sum, the infinite sum, where K goes from zero to infinity of negative one to the K divided by two K plus one factorial times theta to the 2k plus one. Expanding this infinite sum term by term, we say that the first version of that is gonna be theta minus one over three factorial theta cubed plus one over five factorial theta to the fifth minus one over seven factorial theta to the seven plus one over nine factorial theta to the ninth plus dot dot dot. We do that infinitely out. But the claim is if we focus right around zero, if we focus on small values of theta, let's take like theta is equal to 0.1, for example. So this would be sine of 0.1 is 0.1 minus one over three factorial 0.1 cubed, but 0.1 cubed is one over 10 raised to the third. That's one over a thousand. If we look at the difference between 0.1 and one over a thousand, this would be one over something like a hundred thousand, one with five zeros. That is negligible for small values of theta. Another way to say this is if I look at 0 0.1, we're claiming that the linear term actually really closely approximates the sine of that value. And indeed, if we looked at the difference between the two of those, if I took the, um, absolute value of sine of 0 0.1 and I subtracted away 0 0.1, which is just the input, I get something that looks like 10 to the negative four. So the air between the measurement of sine for small thetas and the measurement of theta itself, whatever the input is, is really, really small. And that's what's happening here. Mathematicians sometimes get lazy and we say, okay, when we're looking at the air between these two things, it's on the order of theta to the third. In other words, for small values of theta, the sine of theta is closely approximated by theta itself. This is the source of the idea of linearization. Notice that the sine is nonlinear. In the Taylor series approximation, what that means is we have a bunch of nonlinear terms, polynomials, in particular, odd powered polynomials, cubes, fifth powers, seventh powers, ninth power, that kind of determine the behavior of sine away from zero. But if we focus around zero, if we focus really, really close to the small values of theta, those terms disappear because when I take something close to zero to a high power, that gets really, really, really close to zero. So the air goes away. And in fact, it is common practice when we're linearizing sine. If we focus on thetas that are less than 0.1 radians, in other words, around seven degrees. So my pendulum is kind of oscillating back and forth, but the angle of oscillation gets no more than about seven degrees or 0.1 radians. The claim is that the air between these two measurements is less than 0.1%. In other words, this approximation holds within 0.1% of the original value that we're searching for. That was a really fancy way to say the same exact idea that you studied in an earlier calculus class. Remember that we talked about this idea of linearizations of a function. So if I'm looking at a particular function and I slap a tangent line at that function at any point A, 
I can approximate the behavior of the function using the tangent line as long as I stay local around that point. So the linearization of the function sine at the value a equals zero, define, go back and look at your calculus notes if you need this, but the point of the matter is when I linearize sine around zero, I can do that using theta. As a quick recall, we can actually graph this. Let's go to desmos.com, which is our online calculator. We'll go ahead and write sine of x in this thing, and then we'll write x. Now, if we zoom in on this graph here, notice that the red and the blue, the red is the sine of theta, the blue is just theta. Around point one, our eyes can't actually see the difference between the two of them because focused around zero, the linear function, the tangent line to sine, looks really, really close to sine itself. That is a linearization. But what that implies is that sine of theta, which was by trigonometry, u of t divided by l, the distance between the two shadows along my horizontal axis, we can approximate that with theta, which gives us direct relationship between theta of t and u of t. This approximation holds valid for theta of t less than 0.1 radians or about seven degrees. In the physics literature, this is called the small angle approximation or small angle oscillations of our pendulum. For students that wanna learn more about this, there's a beautiful paper on this subject called An Accurate Formula for the Period of a Simple Pendulum Oscillating Beyond Small Angle Regime. It's by a group of scholars Lima and Arun. If you type that title into DuckDuckGo or Google, the first hit you would get is a PDF copy of that paper. You can click on it and download it. In fact, that's exactly what I've done here. And they actually discuss some of the background theory behind small angle approximations and give a kind of a nice overview of what would happen if that assumption breaks down. You're welcome to read that. The point of the matter is that we just have two different ways of calling this approximation. Physicists call that small angle oscillations. Mathematicians say, that's a prudent assumption to make sure the linearization is a good approximation for the original behavior. With that small angle oscillation assumption in hand, we now immediately relate theta of t to u, and that means that theta dot, the first derivative of theta, is the first derivative of u of t over l. One over l is a constant, we can bring that out because l is the measured length of our pendulum cord. That's a positive value, that means this is positive. When I take the derivative of u of t, that's literally just u dot. But that implies that the second derivative of theta is the derivative of the first derivative. We know what that first derivative looks like. So it's the derivative of u dot divided by l. Again, I can bring the one divided by l out. That's the derivative of u dot, which is u double dot. But now we've successfully replaced all appearances of theta in our second order nonlinear differential equation by appearances of u linearized locally using a small angle approximation so that the second order differential equation governing pendulum motion is replaced by a second order linear differential equation governing the motion of the shadow projection of the pendulum onto the horizontal axis under the pendulum itself. The replacement of the first term came from our small angle assumption that theta was less than 0.1 radians. This replacement came from our study of trigonometry and we can eliminate the extra appearance of L in both terms by just multiplying both sides of our equation by L. That leads to a linearized differential equation that replaces the study of the motion of the bob with the study of the motion of the projection or shadows of those bob along the horizontal axis. So solving this equation for our displacement function u would actually tell us where that dot is at any time during the motion of our pendulum under the assumption that that bob doesn't travel more than seven degrees away from equilibrium position. This transformation from a very, very hard problem that has no exact analytic solution from the standpoint of our previous lives in calculus into a linearized problem. Not only is that technique super powerful in linear algebra, but this new approximation of our differential equation, this new linearized differential equation, shows up in introductory physics and introductory ordinary differential equations as a canonical form of a simple harmonic oscillator. 
we know a lot about these problems and we can actually use that intuition to solve them and get insights into the behavior of the larger problem, of course, assuming that our small angle approximation is valid. Before we do more to interpret what's going on with this transformation, I do want to mention this. This technique shows up many, many, many places in applied mathematical context. The point is, nonlinear life is really, really difficult. Linear life is much easier. Anytime we see nonlinear equations, after we get done crying, one of the immediate questions is, can we linearize locally and then bring linear algebra to bear? Some of the most powerful techniques in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics depend on this context. In fact, I like to quote that mathematics is the process of turning problems into linear algebra. In other words, linearization under the appropriate assumptions. To finish up this video, I wanna discuss a few fine points and really wrap this up in a way that gives visual intuition to this transformation. We claimed that this differential equation was nonlinear because the desired function was being manipulated by a nonlinear operation, which was the sign of that function. Down here, the transformation into the linear regime, this is linear because the desired function is only scalar multiplied by g over l, and then the derivative operator is linear itself. Both multiplication and addition pass through derivative operators. But just as the original differential equation was a sneaky way of stating Newton's second law, so too this linear differential equation, this transformation into a different form, is also a sneaky way to state Newton's second law. Specifically, if we bring this term over to the other side, we can actually introduce masses on both sides. And remember that we said that the sum of all forces acting on a point mass is equal to the mass times the acceleration. This form is Newton's second law. The question is, this is the mass times the acceleration, what is the actual force acting on the shadow projection? But we can say something very interesting and intelligent about what that force might be. Specifically, remember that in the pendulum bob itself, the only force that had an effect on the motion of that pendulum was the component of the force of gravity that was perpendicular to the axis defined by the cord or along the tangential axis to my arc shape curve. Specifically, we call that F sub G sub T perp because it was the force of gravity in the direction of tension perpendicular to that direction. And we said that that was negative M times G times sine of theta. Go back and watch that if you'd like. In the small angle approximation, we said that the sine of theta was approximately equal to theta of T, but exactly equal to U of T divided by L, which means when I see this term, I can replace it by U of T divided by L. And that means I can group all of the measured scalars together and approximate that force using a scalar multiple times the displacement, which we're going to call the force of the pendulum along the U axis or the horizontal component of the force as an approximation for the force in the tangential axis. But in this approximation scheme, that means we have two different representations for our approximate force on the actual bob. Here is the exact force in the tangential axis. Here is the approximation to that force along the U axis or the force of the pendulum along the U axis. In math notation, I call that the vector F sub P sub U, the force of the pendulum along the U axis, that's in the negative direction of our displacement. And we can write that using Newton's second law as the mass times the acceleration or the mass times the second derivative of the displacement. But that means that my acceleration is in the opposite direction of my force and my force is a scalar constant times my displacement. That behaves very similar to a spring, doesn't it? We said that the spring force is in the opposite direction and it's literally just directly proportional to the displacement. So in this case, this thing is behaving like our spring constant K. And that's what we meant when we said that this differential equation was like a simple harmonic oscillator. This equation right here is super similar to the dynamics of a spring. The second derivative, the acceleration is equal to the negative 
constant proportion times the displacement. This implies that what we've done with our linearization is not only greatly simplify the mathematical analysis needed to solve this in terms of theta, but also replaced our original problem with a proxy problem that as long as my angle is small, instead of studying the location of the bob in three space, we can study the location of the shadow projection of the orthogonal projection of that bob onto the U axis and then replace forces in the tangential axis with forces along that axis. So now we can approximate the force of the pendulum along the U axis as a good measurement of that other force that we were looking for. Let's take a look at an animation that might help us visualize what we mean by this. Here we have our pendulum in our fixed stable support structure. The bob is up in the right extreme point. We have in the blue arrow the component of the force of gravity along the tangential axis, along the axis tangent to the arc-shaped path. Down here we have the projection of that bob onto the ruler underneath or the shadow orthogonal projection. The blue arrow along that U axis is the linearized version of our blue force arrow. Here we're under the assumption that we have small angle approximation. As I let that bob travel, as I let the dynamics of the pendulum move, we see that forces on the bob in the actual motion are linearized, are approximated by forces on the shadow projection, on the orthogonal projection along the U axis. This situation gives rise to a simple harmonic oscillator since if we were to attach a spring between the equilibrium position and the shadow here on the U axis, that spring would exert a force identical to this projected version of that force, which means as I get further and further away from equilibrium, the spring constant, the proportionality of the force is directly proportional to the displacement away from equilibrium. As I get closer to equilibrium, the stored force in that spring gets closer to zero, which is what we're looking at. And then we move back away from equilibrium. The farther we move, the larger that force gets. And we're seeing in this translated system, in this linearized differential equation, we're getting the same behavior that we would expect. Now, the reason that this is super useful is you could imagine bringing the U axis, instead of aligning that U axis down below, this force could actually be thought about as acting on this mass. So when we were thinking about the pendulum motion, we could think about the U as happening through the center of mass in the actual pendulum motion frame. That's super relevant because later as we learn how to use these linearizations in practice, it is sometimes helpful to be able to think about the force of the pendulum as happening horizontally in the U axis where the pendulum stands. The point of the matter though is that we have translated the nonlinear dynamics of this pendulum into a linear approximation along the U axis and we're claiming as long as our angle is small, that approximation behaves quite well. This mathematical simplification comes in super handy. We're going to see this in the construction of eigenvalue problems for a coupled pendulum. And in fact, we're going to use that horizontal force in order to say something really, really intelligent about the dynamics of the pendulum itself for small angle approximations. Moreover, when we solve this, we're going to see the proxy measurement equation actually gives us insight into the original equation for our small angle approximation. And with that, perhaps I should turn into a salesperson. Life is linear as long as we look close enough. In the next video, we'll discuss the ramifications of this transformation. I'll see you there.